Pascal's wager posits that since we can't possibly determine the existence of God, we can at least determine the potential consequences of committing to a life of God worship. According to Pascal, there is everything to gain from worshipping God if he does exist, due to his heavenly reward, and nothing to lose if there is no reward. Whereas, if you choose not to believe in God, there is everything to lose if there is a reward. Especially if there's also a punishment in the form of well, you know, hell. I'd argue that viewing religious devotion this way is to reduce it to a mere self-serving gamble, a simple game of collecting moral points. Perhaps it should come as no surprise then that the developers at Odd Meter basically turned the concept of Pascal's Wager and the implied moral point collecting into an actual video game. <laughs> Collecting points has been one of the primary goals of video games since the days of Pong, so it only makes sense that a game like Indica would be especially suitable for telling a story about religion through the lens of gamification. If you're new to the channel, my name is Pim, this is my crypt, and if you support me on Patreon, you can be a part of it too. The protagonist of this story the titular Indica, is a nun working in an orthodox Catholic convent, in a strange alternate take on 19th century Russia. She struggles with visual and auditory hallucinations, which have resulted in her fellow nuns turning their backs on her. They make her perform menial but arduous tasks, like gathering water from a well, only to spitefully pour it all out on the ground once her work is done. Eventually, they decide to send Indica out on a mission to deliver an envelope outside the convent an envelope that is later implied to contain her own letter of resignation. They probably would have thrown her out sooner, had they known that Indica's most persistent hallucination is the voice of none other than the devil himself. Or at least, that's what Indica believes him to be. After all, what is the devil, if not sinful thoughts manifest? With no other options, Indica joins, or rather is taken hostage by an escaped convict named Ilya, who believes that God has spoken to him through a cup requesting he fulfill a divine purpose. In a cathedral in the city of Spasov, there is a relic called the Cudets. Ilya believes that this relic will heal him from the lethal infection coursing through his left arm. Indica gradually grows an attachment to Ilya. His quest gives her a new sense of purpose, and he is quite handsome to boot. He also allows Indica a luxury she never had at the convent, the opportunity to openly air her skepticism of her faith. If you're God's chosen one, why didn't God heal you completely right away? This creates an intriguing dynamic. A nun who questions her faith, and a prisoner of war looking for divine redemption. One speaks with the devil, the other with God. In a way, these characters personify the polar opposites of Pascal's wager. Ilya's conviction have him enact violence onto others, even disregarding his clearly fatal condition. Because surely, God will reward him as long as he sticks to his religious beliefs. Indica, on the other hand, strays further and further from her role as a nun as she experiences the moral grace of the outside world. The game is critical of religious belief, and more specifically religious institutions, but it's not a completely one-sided critique. Rather, it simply asks a crucial question that is left out of Pascal's wager. If there is nothing to lose from devoting yourself to God, why do people choose not to? What literally stands out the most about the game is its point system. Indica accumulates points through religious gestures and collecting various scriptures and tokens. Once she has reached a threshold, Indica will level up, allowing the player to choose between different perks, which may grant either short or long-term point bonuses, which increase the rate of leveling up. The game makes it perfectly clear early on that the pursuit of these points is completely superfluous. Yet curiously, they are the singular constant element of the game's user interface. Even in a limited amount of cutscenes, the amount of points you have and how many you need to reach the next level are distractingly displayed in the top left corner of the screen. Why put that much focus on the points if they are indeed pointless? The reality is, even though the game says there is no value to them, what it actually means is that there is no inherent value. Anyone who's ever played a 2D Super Mario game can certainly relate to the urge to pick up every visible coin on each and every level. But how many people actually care about their final score? Who even remembers it once the next level starts? The coin's actual value is derived from the satisfaction of collecting them. The Pavlovian response to hearing that all-too-familiar 
It's designed to be fun to jump around in these levels, and the coins give the player an additional incentive to use that mechanic. There is of course another incentive, which is that the game will give you an extra life for every hundredth coin you collect. Though with re-releases featuring quality of life improvements, such as being able to rewind your fatal mistakes, and sequels moving away from the series' arcadey roots, where the concept of extra lives was a thinly veiled excuse to make players pay more money, the extra life has become somewhat redundant to the Super Mario games. What remains then is the value you personally find in the coins if you find any at all. We don't really prefer to use the word addictive. We think it's associated with negative, uh, negative connotations. We prefer to use the term compelling. It might come off as a deeply unserious observation, but strictly from a gameplay perspective, Indica's journey is not at all dissimilar to Super Mario's, even down to the fact that Indica tries to be a good and faithful nun through her point collecting, in the hopes that she will one day gain entrance to heaven. Because what is an afterlife, if not an extra life? The obvious difference is that, while Mario can rest assured that he will receive that green one-up mushroom once he has grabbed that hundredth coin, Indica lives in the quote-unquote real world, where there's no such guarantee. She may collect all the points in the universe and gain absolutely nothing from them. There's also the more overt parallel in Indica's occasional flashbacks to her childhood, where the aesthetic and gameplay makes a hard shift to the era of 16-bit platformers. It's an effective shorthand for conveying Indica's sense of wholesome nostalgia. If you were born in the early 90s, or before, chances are that the video games you grew up with looked a whole lot like this, and the emotions this aesthetic evokes are likely in perfect sync with the ones Indica feels as she's reminiscing about these moments. In this context, the points make perfect sense. They're not strangely juxtaposed to a cold and harsh reality. They simply hover around in convenient breadcrumb trails like they usually do in child-friendly platformers. If we view the points as a visual representation of what Indica finds personal value and meaning in, it's noteworthy how many more of them are visible during these flashbacks. You find them along the racetrack where she competes against her father on her brand new motorbike. You find them along the side of her building as she climbs up to meet a boy on the roof. By contrast, as an adult, Indica only finds points when she dedicates herself to her role as a nun. She has been conditioned by her convent to only find value and meaning through the acts that relate to her worship of God. Indica's only private possession through the game is a bracelet of rosary beads. She clenches these beads whenever the player utilizes the game's praying mechanic, which is required to solve some of the game's puzzles. It's evident from the scarring on her hand that Indica has clenched these beads a lot, even before the game began, to the point that her prayers might actually have done her more harm than good. Mortification of the flesh is, historically, not uncommon within the various forms of Christianity. It's been used for disciplinary purposes, as well as a way of coming spiritually closer to Jesus Christ, through replication of his physical plight. An example of this would be the practice of self-flagellation, some more socially accepted and arguably way less harmful variants of this would be fasting or abstinence. Given that Indica's convent showed such open hostility towards her, it's not much of a leap to assume that a lot of the physical pain that Indica has inflicted on herself was the indirect or even direct result of her mistreatment by the convent. Of how the nuns convinced her that, whatever she did, it was never good enough. When being good is tied to specific normative behaviors, anyone like Indica, who struggles with schizophrenic hallucinations as well as intrusive thoughts, will be at a clear disadvantage. Indica can't control whether she will have an episode that causes a disturbance during a religious ceremony, but that shouldn't label her or her behavior as deliberately disruptive or sinful. The pressure of having to perform a certain way, of having to think a certain way, might be what triggers some of those episodes in the first place, especially when that pressure is built on the reactions from past failures. Philosopher Kenneth Burke developed a theory called dramatism, which posits that people and their actions in life parallel actors adapting to and playing out social interactions. This is relevant in the way that Indica has to mask herself in order to fit in. One of the most provocative points of dramatism, though, is that the actions people make in these interactions are mainly motivated by a wish to rid themselves of guilt. It's essentially the concept of the original sin, that you're born a sinner and that you're obligated to spend the rest of your life striving for redemption, sometimes through self-destructive means. Indica has kind of an original sin of her own, trying to run away with the boy she liked, with the money stolen from her father's store, resulting in the boy getting shot to death. With this unresolved trauma, and having spent day in and day out with more feelings of guilt being thrust upon her by the nuns at the convent, 
Indica's actions are certainly motivated by that sense of guilt, but with little to no indication that she can or will be redeemed. In an episode of This American Life podcast, writer and audio producer Bowen Wang talks about how his personal experience of a not-Christian cult made him internalize a similar sense of guilt and self-hatred. This is the main thing I learned from Christianity, that I am a worthless piece of shit. And listen, I know that that's not the main message of the gospel. I know Jesus teaches us that we're redeemed by his sacrifice, that we're all children of God, but all that nice, feel-good stuff bounced right off of me. What was drilled into my mind, and what I really internalized, is that while I'm a child of God, I'm also a child of Adam, who ate the forbidden fruit offered to him by Eve, and whose original sin I inherit. Christians remind you of it all the time. I was at a wedding where the groom's brother told the newlyweds they need to never forget that they're broken sinners. At a celebration of the couple. So I learned to hate myself. I need to punish myself every moment of every waking hour of every day for my sinfulness, which morphs into a need to punish myself for anything I've ever done that's vaguely embarrassing. I believe this is why Indica keeps tabs of all of her good deeds, why she has boiled down her god worship to a definitive numeric science. It's the only kind of worship she can truly rely on, because gathering points is comparatively easy to conceptualize. She knows how and where to get these points. There's no one to tell her that she's collecting the points wrong, and it feels good to collect them, to see the numbers go up, to feel like there is something that she can do right for once. But which are the correct actions to make as a believer in God? One of the collectibles in the game tells the story of Saint John, a God-fearing monk who one day fell into a pit. Uncertain of God's intentions with him, John remained in the pit for several days. Once he finally started to pray, he found a branch and climbed out. However, as the God-fearing man that he was, John convinced himself that the branch was in fact the work of a demon trying to tempt him. And so he jumped back down into the pit and prayed for God's forgiveness. In return, John was, quote, awarded with numerous spiritual gifts. This story, I think, foreshadows a decision that Indica eventually has to make. As the infection in Ilya's arm reaches a tipping point, Indica is forced to choose between cutting his arm off or letting him die. One choice is clearly better than the other. Right? Well, what if this is another one of God's tests? What if this is where Ilya is supposed to die? Would Indica be interfering in God's plan if she helped him? What if the opposite is true? That Indica was sent to protect and save Ilya? Wouldn't she then be committing a sin for letting him die? Maybe God still views Ilya as an unredeemed sinner, making it fine to leave him for dead. Though shouldn't a nun, as an agent of God, grant him forgiveness? Unlike St. John, Indica doesn't have days to mull all of this over. She has minutes, maybe seconds, to make this life-altering decision. She decides to save Ilya. But it ultimately ends up being a choice that, as far as the plot is concerned, dooms him. As the pair reaches the city of Spasov, and the cadets kept inside its cathedral, they're apprehended by the city guard. Though not before a priest is tragically killed in the crossfire. Not only did the cadets not do anything for Ilya, his efforts to reach it have now ended the life of one person and is about to end the life of another, as Indica is going to be executed for the death of the priest. While she is locked up, Indica pleads to the guard to let her out. She would do anything to get out, she says. The guard takes the offer and is then implied to sexually abuse her. As Indica escapes into her mind, all the pointless points she has gathered thus far start to slowly trickle down until there is nothing left. The act of trading her freedom for someone else's sexual pleasure is so shameful to her that all her religiously faithful deeds have lost all their value. To make things worse, the guard tricked her. Of course he did. He was never going to let Indica go. And so in a moment of dissociation, she watches as the devil holds the guard down to the floor while she escapes. Out in the street, she finds Ilya again. Who knows what he might have done to get himself out. After having sold the cadets to a thrift store, he's now walking the streets of Spasov, drunk out of his mind, holding a newly bought trombone. Of course, with just one arm, he fails to play it properly. He returns to the thrift store to argue with the owner, while Indica sits down on the floor, alone, holding the cadets in her lap. With the player's input, she starts to shake it. Points start flying all over the screen. Indica can literally sit here forever collect as many points as the player wants, level up as many times as the player wants. But once they decide to stop, 
Indica will open the cadets to find... Nothing. It's a hollow relic. It doesn't have any inherent value. Its true value is what Indica wants it to be. And she decides that there isn't any. As she drops the cadets to the floor, the point counter disappears. This is what I mean when I say that the game doesn't necessarily condemn religious faith itself. While Indica questions and seemingly abandons her belief in God, what the game is really criticizing is living a life of pretending not to want things, pretending not to feel things, for the sake of achieving an eternal afterlife. As Indica grew older, she found less meaning, less value in the things that once made her happy. What she did find value in were things that neither benefited her nor others. Things that actively harmed her. Her contributions to the convent were neither appreciated nor recognized by anyone. And her and Ilya's belief in the cadets ended up being completely misguided. If anything, the game condemns Pascal's wager that there is everything to lose from not believing in God. Where did that belief leave Indica and Ilya? What if this is the only life either of them gets? Would all their suffering have been worth it? For some people, there is genuine value in religious worship. It fills them with a sense of purpose, of community and joy. It helps them make sense of an overall senseless world. It sure seems to work for the nuns at the convent. Though for Indica, it ultimately doesn't. She realizes that the only way of ridding herself of the devil she carries in the back of her mind, the one staring back at her through a mirror as she shakes the cadets for boundless amounts of points, is to let go of the cadets, to let go of her faith. The disappearance of the point counter may suggest that Indica sees no point in anything anymore. Though I'd argue that it's actually about her deciding not to count the points anymore. For the first time since she was a child, Indica is free to explore her own path, free of expectations and judgment. Indica is an exploration of religion through the lens of gamification, though I would argue that it's also an exploration of the medium of video games itself, our individual relationships to it. After all, Indica can potentially go through the entire game only collecting the bare minimum amount of points. It's the player who decides how much of Indica's time should be spent on seeking these points. And isn't that kind of what playing video games is all about? Some may play a game like Super Mario Bros. and not care about the coins in the slightest, while others might find enjoyment out of focusing on the coins exclusively in an effort to achieve a new world record. Others, like speedrunners, will instead skip out on as much content as possible in order to beat the game faster. Super Mario Bros. doesn't offer much in terms of storytelling, outside of the stories the player creates for themselves through gameplay, so other players might seek out games for their storytelling alone. Video games aren't just one thing. We can experience and interpret a single game in vastly different ways. And just like in life, just like with religious beliefs, I think it all boils down to creating meaning where you see it. Because who knows? Maybe this is all we're ever gonna get. But do you know what you can get? You can get access to a podcast all about the filmography of director George A. Romero, among several other perks, if you support this channel on Patreon. And speaking of, here are some of my current patrons who deserve a special thanks. Anade, Callum Wally, Christopher Barrier, D.E. Wright, Duncan Scott, Eben Phantom, Franz Johannes Foilner, Hovard Krugerud, Jack Lightfoot, Jesse Earl, Kalis, L. Tantevi, Lesser Sage of Stars, Losty, Mackenzie, Nicole, Quillightful, Robin Hartz, Rowan Woodcock, Sable Cow, Seth Sard, Silk Moth, TB Skyen, Ten Tiny Kittens, and Vinders. I also want to thank Aranok, Kevin from the Pixel Lit Podcast, Mira Cox, and VZ Shows for proofreading the script. You'll find their channel links in the description. So. How are y'all doing? 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 doing? Does a dog have a soul? Don't it all that masters?
Is that even possible without a soul? Does one need a soul to feel love? Is it possible to love without a body? What remains if you deprive a dog of a body? How can it love something it can't hear or sniff? How can it remember someone it loves if it loses its brain with its memories? In a world without bones, cold, procreation, beautiful women, rich men, bodies, basically, passion, kindness, love. Can any of it exist without the body? For a dog. What? Ah, uh, yes. F for a dog. <laughs>